And as I mentioned, we will be back in the book of Daniel. Uh, We are up to Daniel chapter 4, and we'll be reading verses 19 through 27. And we're kind of catching the story uh, midway through here. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king, has had uh, a vision. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to the vision in the passage itself, so we don't really have to go back and rehash this vision. Uh, it will come up in the passage. Uh, but what is of note is he's had to call in Daniel again. He brought in his people, his magicians and sorcerers and all of those, and once again they've let him down, as they've done in the past. And so now Daniel is called in to uh, interpret uh, the vision. And that's where we will pick up. It's Daniel uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 19. And as I read this, I do want to remind you, this is in the voice, actually, of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel writes it, but he's writing it in the voice. Uh, So when we notice that uh, he calls him Belteshazzar, uh, it's because it's, it's Nebuchadnezzar who's narrating, if you will. Starting at verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven, it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in, who, in, and in which was food for all under which beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field and let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king that you shall be driven from among men And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity." The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for speaking into our hearts. And Lord, as we look at this passage, we pray that you will speak it loudly in our hearts, that we will know you better and be strengthened in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several years ago, I uh, worked at a window factory, and I may have mentioned that to some people, and I worked swing shift, and there was a, a guy that I had known for years, and from elementary school, we, we uh, graduated together. Uh, he lived a couple blocks away. His name was Tom, and uh, I would give him a ride when we worked on the same shift. Uh, he, he worked some weird shifts once in a while, but 
but I would give him a ride, and a really enjoyable guy. And as long as I'd known him, he's the most calm, coolest guy you'd ever meet. Nothing is a big deal. Things could be falling down all over the place, and Tom would shrug his shoulders and just kind of move on, not really worried about it. He'll figure it out. We'll, we'll get by. One of those guys, very pleasant to be around. He, I, I mean this all in a good way. Well, one night I was working 3 to 11, and he was working the overnight. He was coming in at 11, and, and so towards the end of our shift, uh, the alarms in our building go off and there's tornadoes and severe weather and all of this. And, and I was on the second floor, so I had to go down to the first floor with, with uh, the crew I was with. And, and there was a window open and a, a huge gust of wind came blowing in and knocked things over. And we started thinking, this is pretty bad. And then some people started to drift in that were going to work the overnight shift. And we would ask them, how, how is it out there? And we were just getting bad reports. It's terrible. And sometimes you were getting things second and third hand. And, and you know, as the stories go, they get bigger and bigger. You know, and we're expecting the very worst. This sounds terrible, what's going on out there. Well, then Tom comes in. Thought, oh, good, Tom's here. Tom will set us all straight. And someone saw him and said, Tom. What's it like out there? And Tom said, it's pretty bad. Tom says it's pretty bad? Well, this is bad then. I wasn't worried, but now that Tom says it's bad, this has got to be bad. And that's kind of what's going on with Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar here. Daniel, as we have seen, he's the coolest, calmest guy. He doesn't really get rattled by anything. Nebuchadnezzar does things. It doesn't rattle Daniel at all. And, and I could put Daniel's friends in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, the king can threaten them. The king can try to make them do things. They don't care. They're always cool and calm, collected. They know God's in control and they're fully focused on God. And so when we get to this passage and see in verse 19, Daniel was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him, we start thinking, whoa, this is bad. But notice King Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, don't let this bother you. Don't let it alarm you. Tell me what it is. And Daniel answers, my Lord, may, may the dream be for those who hate you. May, may this be for your enemies, but, but not for you. Nebuchadnezzar should probably be concerned at this point. He, he knows Daniel, and Daniel really doesn't get bent out of shape about things unless it's really necessary. I don't know that the king has even seen this yet. And he has seen the power of Daniel's God. He threw three guys into a fiery furnace. Nothing happened to them. He, underst he should understand the power of Daniel's God. And Daniel here is alarmed. And in a bit of role reversal, the king is trying to comfort Daniel. Daniel, just tell me what it is. Now we know Nebuchadnezzar. He's a uh, sinful monarch. He's easily impressed with himself and easily impressed with his kingdom. His kingdom is really his joy. He said some good things about Daniel's God earlier, but he always goes back to his own kingdom. He humiliated Israel uh, and Daniel's people, and yet Daniel is, is calm <coughs> Until now, he's dismayed. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel, don't be dismayed. Just tell me what it is. And before we go on to what it is, I, I do want to focus on Daniel just a little bit. And on Daniel's heart. Because Daniel, his mind is on God fully. We've seen that throughout so far. God-centered, and he's a prayerful man. 
there was hints of that earlier, and we especially see it when you move on to chapter 6, verse 10. He prays three times a day, and that seems to be his routine. He does this all the time, a prayerful man. And we can see that his life and his approach to other people, even the king, is highly influenced by his devotion to God, that he's God-centered and prayerful. And we imagine praying for other people, even the king. He's full of compassion. And we see that. We've seen that throughout. We see it here as well. He's full of compassion. He does follow uh, some of the social customs by saying, King, may this be for your enemies. That was something you would say to a king. King, may you live, but let this be for your enemies. But he is completely faithful to God and at the same time is faithful to King Nebuchadnezzar. He's not going to lie to him. And in fact, he's going to try to encourage him Even through this, Daniel reverently fearful of God, but caringly fearful for the king. And those two go hand in hand. And we'll consider Daniel's heart a little bit more later on. But when we think of where Daniel is and the king, we can relate that a lot to our own lives. When we think of sinful people in our lives, because they can produce a lot of emotions in us sometimes. Sometimes it's anger or frustration. Sometimes it's almost a sense of helplessness, especially when it's someone we know and love and they just keep doing the wrong thing. Sometimes when it's not someone you, you know and love like that, it almost produces amusement. You're almost, I can't believe they're doing this again. You know, you, you, how stupid can a guy be? They keep doing this over and over again. Uh, but are we fearful for them like Daniel is? We know we can't save them, but we can be compassionate to them and for them. Because in our world, there are so many with Nebuchadnezzar's mindset. Just this complete lack of understanding the things of God. The complete lack of understanding the urgency of being right with God. Of knowing your salvation. They don't have any concern for that at all. They're wrapped up in their own little kingdoms, their own little worlds. And so it is up to us to be fearful for them, to be compassionate and encouraging to them. You know, there's an interesting passage in Philippians chapter 2 as we see Daniel's concern for the king here. Paul is writing to the people in Philippi, and in chapter 2, starting at verse 20, He's sending Timothy, and and he mentions this. He said, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. And he's talking about their spiritual welfare. Who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And when you think about that verse a little bit, you think about seeking Christ's interests, and that is being genuinely concerned for others' spiritual welfare. And we see that in Daniel. And Daniel talks about this vision, this dream, or this, this, this tree that you saw, it grew and became strong, its top reached to heaven, it was visible to the ends of the whole earth, leaves beautiful, fruit abundant, the food for all, the beasts of the field found shade in it, branches for the birds of the heavens. It's, it's this vision, this glorious vision that the king had. But then Daniel says, it is you, king. It is you. You've grown strong. Your greatness has grown. 
It reaches to the heaven, your dominion to the ends of the earth. And I really don't think that Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar something here that he didn't know already. When Nebuchadnezzar had the dream and the other people were brought in, I think he had a pretty good idea. This is about his kingdom because he knows his kingdom is the kingdom. It's like those football players, you know, when they uh, announce who they are on TV and, and then uh, say what college they came from and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm whoever from the university. Uh, if Nebuchadnezzar were on TV, he'd say, I'm Nebuchadnezzar from the kingdom. This is it. This is the one that matters. And Nebuchadnezzar knows that. And on a purely earthly, uh, man-centered level, um, and we've been here with Nebuchadnezzar before, what more can be accomplished by him? He's got everything, and he knows that. And he's got resources for just about any problem that comes up. And I think that explains a little bit of his insensitivity to this vision that he's having. Even when Daniel is concerned and he's not, he has this attitude, don't worry, Daniel, I'll figure it out. I've got the resources. He, he's a man's man, isn't he? That's, a, that's like a, something a man says right there. Don't worry, I'll figure it out. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar's at. But on an actual level, on a God-centered level, does he really have the resources to confront this? Is he really prepared for this? You know, sadly, I remember reading, and this was years ago, uh, many of you remember Timothy McVeigh who blew up that federal building in Oklahoma City and, and was sentenced to death. And I remember reading an article and a fellow prisoner uh, came up to him, started asking him about things and, and kind of confessing things to Timothy uh, McVeigh. And, and, and he never really admitted to any wrongdoing at all. And then this... Uh, in, according to this article, this, this prisoner asked him, well, but what happens when you die? There, you're going to die in a few days. And what happens in the afterlife when you have to face this? And I'm paraphrasing here, but McVeigh's reply was, I'll adjust. I'll adapt. I'll figure it out. It's too late. You can't adjust or adapt. Your time is now to confess this. But Nebuchadnezzar has that attitude. I'll figure it out. And when we ponder the sovereignty of God, you know, this, this, this book of Daniel is, is the early part and even the last part is, is really highlighting the sovereignty of God in his kingdom. And we think of the sovereignty of God, and we'll mention the sovereignty of God sometimes, but, but sometimes, not to make light of it, but sometimes we treat it almost the way we think of your refrigerator keeping something cold. You know, we know that it does, but we just take it for granted. You know, we open the refrigerator, we pull something out, it's cold, and we say, well, yeah, that's what a refrigerator does until that day when you reach in and you grab something and it's not cold and then your eyes are open and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, I was kind of depending on this. And that's how the sovereignty of God is. Sometimes we just kind of let it pass. We, Yeah, he's sovereign, we know that, and we move on with our day. We don't really think about it, but every now and then our eyes have to get opened and we say, whoa, wait. I'm kind of depending on God's sovereignty. And sometimes it does us good to really consider that. He created all things. He is the cause of all things. It's not that he can do all things. It's that he does all things. He's sovereign over everything. And Daniel knows that and his concern for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a little simple-minded about these things still. 
But Daniel continues in verse 23, because this, the king saw this watcher, this holy one, coming down and saying, chop down the tree, destroy it, but leave the stump. And, and then he talks about this band of iron and bronze, the tender grass of the field and, and the wet dew of heaven and, and uh, his portion, the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is a little confusing uh, for Nebuchadnezzar and even a little bit confusing for us when we first read it. But Daniel, he knows and he, in verse 24, says, This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon the Lord my king, that you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as Daniel is saying this, I, I would love to have been there and just seen King Nebuchadnezzar and how is he reacting and, and, and wonder well, what is he contemplating as Daniel is, is telling him this there's that first confusing part but even that, that second part that seems quite clear you wonder if Nebuchadnezzar is thinking this has got to be some kind of metaphor right I'm not really going to eat grass am I I mean no one's going to make me eat grass you see, in Nebuchadnezzar's own eyes, he's, he's back in verse 20 and 21. He's the strong one. His kingdom reaches to heaven. Uh, his leaves are beautiful, food for everyone. Uh, he supplies for everyone. That's Nebuchadnezzar in his own mind. But now Daniel's saying, no, you're going to eat grass like an ox. Uh, the early 1900s. Uh, English Anglican priest, uh, William Temple, he once said, I make myself in a host of ways the center of the universe. And that's Nebuchadnezzar. I'm the center of the universe, certainly not going to eat grass. In his mind, he's probably thinking, this has got to mean something else, right? But we remember, he's a little simple-minded. And God does, in Scripture, often use metaphors and allegories and symbolism and parables. We saw Jesus use a lot of parables. The last half of Daniel is full of crazy visions and metaphors and symbolism. But often, then, God will get very, very direct for the simple-minded. And he does that here for King Nebuchadnezzar, you will eat grass. And I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar's thinking, well, that can't be right. You know, I, I sometimes think of situations like this. Uh, you tell a child sometimes when he's throwing rocks and, and there's windows and, and the child is throwing rocks and you say, don't throw rocks, it'll break windows, you know, go somewhere else and throw the rocks. But then when someone grows up, you can use uh, an allegory. Uh, you see somebody who's, who's criticizing someone else and, and they're just being hypocritical, you know, they've got the same faults. And then you say something like, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, you know. And, and there's different meanings there. Sometimes you can get uh, a little... Uh, tricky with your language. Sometimes you have to be very, very direct. And here, uh, God is being very, very direct with King Nebuchadnezzar about judgment. You're going to eat grass like an ox. And we deal with this in our world even. Because there's concepts of sin and evil and judgment and, and hell. And people will sometimes get very creative with these ideas. Certainly that can't be real, right? God certainly wouldn't judge in that way, would he? God is, is very clear 
about judgment, but they'll sometimes invent metaphors and come up with ideas that first of all, you wonder, well, is it really real? And second of all, then they'll make it sound, well, it's not that bad. Because they're just simple-minded to the things that God is trying to tell them. And when it comes to judgment, God is very clear about some things. And that's why we're concerned about it. And Daniel continues. It was commanded, uh, as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you at the time that you know that heaven rules. There is this, this hint of hope in here. And Daniel, once again, he's trying to encourage the king a little bit. Therefore, as he continues, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquity by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. There's this idea here of repent. Change your ways. You know, this is not yet the final judgment. You have time to repent. He's not pushing the king into some kind of fatalism. I'm sorry, king, it's all over. But he's telling him there, there's hope here. He's encouraging him to change. And in many ways, this little story here is, is our message and our world. There is a sovereign God. There is the coming judgment. You have sinned. And there's hope. There's hope in that. Repent. And in fact, our story even gets better than the one Daniel had to, had to tell because we know Jesus now. Between Daniel and us, Jesus came and died for our sins and lived perfectly righteous, and you can have his righteousness. And there is still time. All is not lost Peter tells us that in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not slow, as some people call slow, but he's patient that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, and we know this. We know all of this. We know here the gospel. We know the coming judgment. But there's something for us to learn even beyond that from this, as we circle back and look again at Daniel's heart. His fear for King Nebuchadnezzar, never afraid of him, but fear for him. Daniel, as a loyal man of God, a prayerful man of God, God has this compassion for him. And we saw that with Jesus when we read the Gospels. Compassion, but also his grief at people's sins. Uh, in fact, in, in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus was healing on the Sabbath, uh, and, and they were wondering, they were waiting for him because they wanted to attack. And so he, he looked around and said, he looked at them with anger, and then it says, grieved at their hardness of heart. Their hardness of heart grieved him. We see it in Paul. One of the places in the, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul writes, I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented. And Paul is saying, I have to mourn over those people. You know, we mourn over our own sins. And, and we're grieved at our own sins. But how about the sins of others? Does that cause us to grieve? And do we mourn for them? We can get angry with them, as I mentioned. We can get frustrated with them. But here's the thing. We know the danger. We know judgment and they just don't know that yet we also know that we can't save them 
But like Daniel, we can encourage them. We can tell them the truth. And at this time of year especially, when we're in this Christmas season and there is more talk of God and this baby Jesus, I always like to make it a part of my prayer life to pray and even grieve and mourn for someone or maybe a few people who I know just don't know the danger they're in. Have the attitude of Nebuchadnezzar. It'll be okay. I'll figure it out when the time comes. But to make it a part of our prayer life, to pray for them. Paul in Philippians chapter 1 you know, he's always praying for these people he writes to. I pray for you all the time. I, I think of you continually. I bring you always before God. In Philippians chapter 1, he writes to them, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. He knows that day is coming and he keeps praying for their purity and their holiness. And I think that's a good prayer for us to have. Grieve over our loved ones' sins and pray heartily for them. And if we can revisit that verse in 2 Peter that I mentioned earlier, and I want to read the whole verse. The, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And if it's that important to God, it should be important to us. Not wishing that any should perish, but that they should reach repentance. And so we pray like it's important, because it is important. We pray because it honors God, first of all, to pray for others. But also, most likely, not always, I will grant you, but most likely, when we pray deeply for someone else, it changes our relationship with that person. And sometimes the change starts in our very own hearts when we're a little more compassionate after all of these prayers on their behalf. And then we let God change their hearts. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that your Holy Spirit has spoken your truth into our hearts, that we know Jesus and the salvation we have, that we know there is a day of judgment and it will be horrible for those who do not repent. And Lord, we think of those who haven't. We think of those who ha seem to have no care of standing before you, Lord, and we cry out for them, that you will change their hearts. Help us in our words and our actions to encourage them and to show them your truth that they may believe and give you praise and worship you for eternity, Lord, being snatched from the fire and brought into your heavenly kingdom. Lord, we pray these prayers with great hope and great confidence because we know you are the sovereign God who can do all things. We pray this in Jesus' name.